So the idea of this panel is to uh, make you think more about the future. Uh, so my colleagues are going to be discussing a few different areas, um, but to set them up, I'd like to give you some possible visions of where things could go, assuming certain technologies play out. So I'd asked you before to think about trends that were most powerful <clears throat> for your work, and also uh, which ones were the most unpredictable. But now, let's imagine what happens to a university when these various trends come true. And those of you who are in my presentation yesterday about technology, you can imagine some of those as well. So let's think about a university 10 years from now. And based on the technology that we currently have, at a very, very conservative level, let me give you some extrapolations. One is that we would have a much richer multimedia environment on campus. So you want to think about, for example, a campus cloaked with augmented reality, uh, where virtual reality is the norm for coursework. You want to think about some level of gamification and gaming in courses. And you want to think about students as producers. This is one of the most critical ideas, that students have always been makers. Students have always made stuff. We've always written papers, made lab reports, made quizzes, and so on. But now with the digital environment, they're much more powerful, and they can be much more shared. Students are now IP holders. Moreover, you want to think about the technological environment on campus as being partly service driven. So people moving around the campus with multiple devices, maybe visible, maybe not visible, interacting with digital services. You also want to imagine a university that is saturated with information and data, where students, faculty, and staff are constantly making data by their interactions with campus, life, with their use of books, with their use of digital resources, with their movements across space. Moreover, you want to think about the campus being massively networked, where every conceivable device can be interconnected to other devices and to other data services. You want to think about not just the Internet of Things, but the University of Things as well. Now, campuses can respond in different ways. Uh, one of them, uh, and especially you think about the trends that I outlined an hour ago, one that we've been seeing is what I've called the queen's sacrifice gambit. You may know in chess that there's a desperate move where you give up your queen in order to win the game. I've been using this as a kind of pejorative metaphor to describe universities that are closing academic programs and laying off tenured faculty. This is partly a move in order to win students. So they will get rid of programs that aren't enrolling enough in order to take that money and put it somewhere else. So ending a philosophy program in order to have a new crime program, for example. Now, it's also possible that in several countries we could be watching what I call peak higher education and what others call uh, the higher education bubble. And this again has to do, if you'll forgive the United States perspective, with our unique approach to financing higher education through financialization. This is the cover of a very, very traditional, very skeptical magazine, uh, which only seeks to identify the best products for customers. And they issued this blistering attack on higher education, uh, arguing that higher education is now too expensive and does not offer enough reward. Uh, we've seen this through uh, anxiety about academic products, that is, our class is good enough, our class is developed enough, our students engaged, our students actually learning. We're seeing this with anxieties about debt. Just to give you a sense about student debt, uh, the good news is about one-third of students graduate without any debt at all, which is fantastic. The two-thirds that do graduate with debt owe roughly $30,000. Uh, you have to imagine being 22 years old, graduating and owing $30,000. That has already cramped the American economy because those students now, those graduates, are less likely to buy a house or to buy a car. And they're also less likely to get married and have children, which means they're depressing the <laughs> demographics even further. Uh, several graduate schools are in crisis mode. The uh, American law school system is now collapsing. We have uh, as many law students as we did in the 1970s. And there's, of course, political pressure. Uh, the Obama administration placed huge pressures on a higher education to reform. Now, this is the secret of uh, American universities. And this is also true in, this pattern is true in many other countries. The idea is that if you go to university, if you devote your hours, your time, 
you're not taking a job somewhere else full time, but you're studying, you will get benefit down the road. You will get a job that pays more. So this is the best data we have on how much more you are likely to earn in your lifetime if you go to university as opposed to if you don't. And you can see that for men, the, this data is kind of sketchy, but the best idea is half a million dollars is how much more you'll earn. So you weigh this against the $30,000 debt, and you can see why people still go to university in the United States. Let's think about this a different way. What if cable vision comes true? What if we have open everything on campuses? What if we have open content, open teaching, open access to scholarly publication, open source software? What does that do to higher education? I call this the fall of the silos scenario. And I want you to imagine the year 2030, what a campus would be like. Now, it's possible that such a campus would be part of a society that has a sharing mindset, where we love to share things, where the old faculty habit of, it's my discovery, I don't want anyone to see it, is different. And the minute we see something, the minute we investigate something, we put it out there to be shared. And this is an economy that has people switching jobs, that has people sharing uh, their IP. This also is a, is a society which has less company loyalty and less loyalty from employers to employees. In such a future, you'd have to imagine more global conversations because we have fewer information silos. It's easier to communicate with people around the world. The filter bubble that we now perceive really pops. There's more access to more content. There's simply more information. And we know that whenever people are confronted with more information, more content, we tend to get more creative. We tend to make more stuff. We tend to remix it and push it back in new ways. On campus, you have to imagine information prices plummeting. So if we have open education resources and open scholarship, that textbooks and journals and monographs will cost less. And again, if my point is correct about information leading to creativity, faculty be more creative and more flexible because they can respond to open education resources, remix textbooks when they teach, for example. IT departments on campuses will also have to be more flexible because their challenges escalate. And academic content gets unleashed upon the world. So you want to think about the developing nations having access to so much scholarship, so much research. Now, there may be some bad things that follow. So whole industries could fall apart in the open world. So you want to think about textbook publishers going away, scholarly publishers. Is anybody here from Holland by any chance? Uh, imagine Elsevier going out of business. That could cheer us up in a lot of ways. But it is also depressing for everybody involved um, in terms of losing their jobs. And we may see some low quality technologies result, ones that open source hasn't succeeded in. For example, video conferencing or computer gaming. We can also imagine some costs escalating. So if we have the fall of the silos, if we have more conversations, if we have more information being shared, we also have more malware being shared. It's a paradise for pirates. It's a great place for phishing. So we may have less privacy as a result as well where if you can share anything, you can share anything. And some people may be less accustomed to having a private space. And scholarship may become more difficult. It may become more fallible if anybody can share anything. I mean, we already have a problem now with fake journals and pseudo-fake journals. Imagine if we can have access to anything that we can really share bad quality content as well. So for campuses, they have to respond with uh, their IT department scrambling to be in charge of all of this because they have to put out a lot more fires. They have to help campuses deal with malware, with phishing, with piracy. We'll probably have more outsourcing, more offshoring. Again, if we have greater global conversations and greater connections and more openness, it's easier to outsource information. So you want to think about outsourcing curriculum or pedagogy. Is that a question? Oh, okay. Uh, I understand. <laughs> it looked like your hand was floating overhead with a question. I didn't want to miss it. Um, we have to imagine that the learning management system, which is a silo of par excellence, will go away, and people will instead turn to personal learning environments. 
Uh, imagine faculty work being more crowdsourced. So think, for example, of astronomers who point to the sky and ask people, please point your telescopes at this, at this particular object we're studying to give us more insight, more feedback. You can imagine psychologists, you can imagine linguists putting their work out, asking for more feedback and crowdsourcing. In such a world, information literacy or digital literacy would have to be central to the curriculum because if you don't have trusted filters, if you don't have trusted guides, you have the Wild West. I want you to imagine a typical college student. Let's just say for the sake of argument, an 18-year-old. And they go to a campus, they go to the university at, at the age 18. What's their life like? Uh, for them, the internet has always been open. They haven't had an iTunes of, you know, or the iTunes app store. They've always been able to get everything all the time. The web for them has never meant a way to make money. And their online identities have always been playful. They're used to pseudonyms and playful identities and roles. Let's contrast that. I'll give you one more scenario. I want you to imagine that we gather together in 2030 um, and we're back here. Well, let's say we're in Valletta. And we're thinking about the previous 30 years. We're looking back. So this is the tricky thing. You go into the future to look back. And we're discussing over drinks, what did we just live through? What did we just experience? And one person says, you know what we lived through? A renaissance. And we say, what? what you? That's crazy. She says, no, 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 listen. Think about the huge boom in human creativity we just went through. So this person goes on. Storytelling is now a tool back in the hands of ordinary people. In the 20th century, storytelling migrated to massive industries, to newspapers, to print publishers, to radio, television, movies, game studios. Well, now anybody can make and share a story. Anybody can capture video, edit video, share it with the whole world. So we have storytelling by video. We have storytelling by social media. For example, this is a, a Facebook account created by a library where they went back into their archives and found a person and made a Facebook account for her to tell the story of her life. You could do this with social media. You could, this is one, for example, this is from Azerbaijan. We can use Tumblr and uh, the blogs to tell stories. This is an actual, not a mock-up, this is from 2012, where the Obama administration asked people to submit digital stories. Digital storytelling in 2030 is now mainstream. Here's an example. This is a Tumblr account called We Are the 99%. Have you all seen this? The idea of this Tumblr account is you submit a photo that has a piece of paper describing your relationship to the 99% concept. That's it. Now take a look at this. My dad died from cancer at the age of 44. We were still paying off his law school loans. We are the 99%. Can you see her face, the bottom of it, and her hand? This is a short story in one photo. It's already there. There's another one. There are plenty of examples of this. I'm 71 and well off, but the economic woes of others impacts my well-being. We are linked to one another and only as strong as the weakest among us. I, too, am the 99%. Oh, look at her face. Look at the ferocity and wisdom of that face. So we can tell stories with digital technology. We do it with Twitter. This is a fun example, staging an alien invasion by Twitter. We do historical events by Twitter. But along with social media, we have the gaming world where we can tell stories by games. And this is something which is pretty widespread and well known. So you want to think right now that most gamers are middle-aged, that's the median age, that if you look at teenagers, roughly 95 to 99% play games. The size of the gaming industry, which is a planetary creative industry, is bigger than Hollywood right now. And it already changes technology. If you don't play any computer games right now, by the way, in 2017, your hardware that you have in front of you reflects that other people do play computer games. If your laptop has beautiful video and sound, that's not because you play Excel. It's because the average person is playing a game that requires that. That's why you can do Skype. We already have political games. So on the top left, that's a political satire game from an Italian political satire games company called Mole Industries. And this is one which encourages you to increase global warming. It's pretty funny in a dark way. 
We also have storytelling through old school computer games. There are plenty of these. I can show you more and more examples. And they appear in academia. Game studies is an established field already with graduate programs, scholarly conferences, scholarly books. Imagine in 2030 where you have an endowed chair of game studies. Libraries play a role in archiving the past. They always have. And they have games now. Now, campuses change. It's 2030 we're talking about this because we have ridiculously rich multimedia on campus. Gaming is part of undergraduate life. Learning content is gamified. Our technology has changed in many ways. We rarely use mice anymore. We have voice commands and touchscreen. And a student who grows up in this world of renaissance, for them, they identified with game characters when they were kids. That became their heroes. Leading game developers are as well known to them as movie directors are now. And most of their schoolwork and some of their work is gamified. So I want to pause and actually let me just quickly skip a few slides because we don't have enough time to talk about the interesting stuff right now. There's too much. But I want to ask you to think. Given these possible glimpses of the future, and given the trends that I articulated earlier this morning and yesterday afternoon, and given what you've heard from presenter after presenter, think about some of the choices that we now face in academia around the world. Are we going to actually spend more money on public universities or less? The logic of the world is neoliberal. Are we going to privatize higher education or will we reinvest in it? Are we going to instead take our universities and academia and focus them on our localities and regions or will our universities become more global in their interactions? Are we going to take our content, our courseware, our scholarship and make it available for the world or are we going to keep it back within silos? As academics, will we embrace social media like the tweeters here who have been so active or will we retreat to the silos? Do we want to rebuild ourselves as academic authorities or do we want to encourage a democratic digital literacy? And do we want to prepare for automation now or do we want to relax and wait to be caught by surprise? The best solution for this is for you to do what you're starting to do in this meeting now, which is to collaborate radically across borders, across sectors, across populations, across professions. We need to do this as openly as possible so we can think collectively. Now, I have other people to talk to, and I just want you to think about what this could be different. Now, why don't, the next person is Jeff. So we need to switch slides. And if, um, I want to reserve questions for what I said for later on and give my colleagues a chance to talk. Thank you. Here is yours.